Hey gang, this is Nick Z from the 4019s. Welcome to Rock Talk, Episode 9. I have a very special guest for you today. He can be heard every day at noon, Eastern, on Little Steven's Underground Garage with the Midday Matinee. And he's also the explosive front man for the Woggles. Please welcome the mighty Manfred. Hey Manfred, welcome to the show. I appreciate you hanging out with me today. Thanks, Nick. Thanks for asking me on. Oh, it's great. A long-time listener of yours on the show, of course, Underground Garage, the midday matinee. Uh, well, I'm a, a, a big fan of the 4019s, you know, dating back to even before uh, John Carlucci's, uh, Speedy John's time in the band there when I first heard the stuff uh, off of, um, God, I can't think of the name of the record now, but I'm looking at the, uh, you know, the 45 adapter. Yeah, the, spin it the, with the black cover yes. and the red. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, all the, all the spins you've given us, too. It's, it's quite an honor. So I'm, I'm very uh, pleased. Well, just, happy. you can't help but write great songs and play great music. So what can I do? All oh, right. On. <laughs> I'm just putty in your hand. Right. <laughs> I, uh, the the uh, impetus of this show is, if you've seen it before, I like to always discover what friends of mine or, or just anyone in general, when they first listen to music, how I always envision when I listen to music or uh, an artist, I can picture when I was a little kid seeing that mm-hmm. album in my dad's or my mother's record collection yeah. or with my 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 buddy's cu- uh, brother upstairs smoking his pot up there and listening to uh, uh, him playing harmonica to uh, Steve Miller band. You know, I can yeah. see those visions just stick with you forever. It seems you know for the good. So now, the thing I learned is, of course, is uh, now where where did you grow up? You were were you uh, around Atlanta in the Atlanta area? Yeah, and so. Um, now I know one thing, of course, is listening through your shows. Your mother, she was re- born in Germany, or was she? Yeah, she she was German and raised in Germany, and met my father uh, in 1960. She came over for a, a study abroad program for a oh, year. Oh wow! Uh huh. And um, she went to uh, University of Georgia because she had read Gone with the Wind. Uh, and uh, then she remarked later on she had no idea that in a hundred years nothing had changed. Right. And um, so when she first came over, in fact, she took a boat over and the boat took her to New York. And then she took a bus from New York down to uh, to South Georgia, where her host family was. This was like a Rotary Club scholarship. Right. And uh, so she got on the bus. And uh, in uh, Europe at that time, the the uh, customary way you would fill up the bus is you always go to the back of the bus first. And, and so the bus would be filled up from back forward. Right. And uh, so... That's, she didn't think that there would be any difference in that, you know, uh, not being aware of the U.S. and at that time, or what's going on exactly. Right. So she promptly set herself back in the back of the bus, and there was no, uh, nothing seemed uh, out of the ordinary for that until the bus got into North Carolina. They switched drivers. And she had noticed in the back of the bus that uh, none of the none of the windows would come. There was no air conditioning on the bus, but none of the windows would come down to the back of the bus. The windows right, in the back right. of the bus were all sealed up, and only the windows in the front part of the bus would let air in. Uh, and um, yeah. so it was very uncomfortable in the back of the bus. And uh, some people in the back of the bus were speaking to her, but she, her English wasn't wasn't that good to understand what their dialect uh, yeah. was. was. And in North Carolina, that's when they switched drivers and the driver started the bus out of the station. And then he caught her, she says, he caught her eye in the river mirror, mirror and she was kind of, you know, kind of half hanging into the aisle because she was so uncomfortable. And yeah. that he made a big production of stopping the bus, marching to the back and demanding she remove herself to the front of the bus or he wasn't going to move it another inch. And she just thought that he was... Uh, recognize how uncomfortable she was and totally didn't realize, you know, what was really going on around her. Right. And, uh, and then it, she finally had the light came on when she was in this uh, a host family in South Georgia and they um, had their uh, uh, people, they, the help was serving them. So they're at this big table and the afternoon meal is being served and you don't serve yourself. Instead the, servants would come around and she said they uh, of course they were all black and they had uh, white gloves on and would you like more mashed potatoes ma'am 
mm-hmm. and you didn't touch the bowl yourself, they would, you know, dip it out for you. And then she had this epiphany, like, you know, holy shit, nothing has changed here in a hundred years. Kind of what, what am I getting myself in right. at that point? Right. Right. So yeah, eventually yeah. she, she, after that, she went to the university of Georgia and she did meet my father there. And, um, you know, they uh, started going out and only recently did I discover that I mean, they just like a long story. So I'll, I'll so, speed no, it no, up that's fine. Yeah. So they, uh, they met each other there and started dating and, she passed away um, about two and a half years ago now. And I thought the big reveal after her death would be that, uh, well, I spoke to my dad and he said, well, hell son, I don't know where your mom was gotten her gun off to. And I said, her gun, I, you know, she was very anti uh, gun. So the fact that she would have a gun was sort of a, what are you talking about? Oh yeah. She's got a 38 special. She bought these hollow tip bullets for it. Oh no. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> Okay, that's kind of mind blowing, right? Big, uh, big anti-gun person. So why the yeah. hell did she have this gun? And uh, well, that goes on to an, 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 another couple of rabbit holes. But anyway, as it turns out, that when um, she and my dad had first gotten uh, together, uh, she had uh, they had gotten pregnant, and this is 1960, 61 at this point. There's no abortion going on in the in the South, right? And uh, she knew she could not return to. Um, Germany with with a child. She had a very contentious relationship with her uh, her mother, mother. and yeah. uh, she knew she would be disowned. And um, so she had the child, but she did not tell this to my uh, father. So they had taken a trip together, and then after this trip, she was supposed to meet him with and meet his family, mm-hmm. and she just didn't show up. And he was he was had been drafted. So after college, he he went and he served in France. And um, she tracked him down after a few months and explained, you know, that she got pregnant. She had the child. Yeah. And um, so I had growing up, my brother and I that I was aware of, we had no idea that there was this older brother. And so that was the big reveal. It was like, wow. Oh, right. So I've only met this guy a, a year ago last Christmas. Oh, wow. He lives in South Georgia. And uh, Neither one of uh, any of our brothers, these three now siblings, you know, physically resemble each other at at least bit, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, But 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 anyway, the point of going into that is, um, yeah, she came over and that's how they met. And I only recently discovered I have this uh, this full brother. Yeah. As as well. No one in the family was aware of this. So my father felt comfortable revealing this. Right. And uh, he had worked for the state of Georgia, and uh, they do have an office that will put parents and children back together if both parties are seeking that. And so right. this uh, this fellow's name is Kevin. He goes, His adopted name is Kevin Cook, and um, he had done so. And when my father found out about this program, uh, by, after working a number of years at the state, he found out about it. And only the mother, since he wasn't part of this birth certificate. And so my mother and Kevin did correspond for a number of years. They never actually met. Right. And uh, after her passing, my dad was very adamant to actually, you know, meet, uh, meet Kevin. And so that's uh, when that occurred. Right. Yeah, it's amazing how as we get older, the things that the modern, you hear similar stories, say, from the younger, the, the more, uh, current generations and it seems yeah. back then it was just a different time yeah. right you, the, the things went unsaid or or and now Absolutely, it's just yeah. it's just a whole different uh seems a lot more uh i don't know it's just uh, yeah people are uh, not as uh i don't know willing to or more willing to reveal now i suppose but it was a whole different time back then as right we, absolutely yeah yeah so but now, what's kind of funny is I went to the University of, of Georgia, and um, for the first two years, I went to Georgia State University, uh, which was, at that time was a commuter school in downtown Atlanta. Uh-huh. Um, and then uh, the next two years, I went to uh, UGA in, in Athens, and that's oh, where, yeah. the, the, where the band started, and I worked at you know, uh, Wax Street Records Wax Street. there for a long time, this record yeah. store in downtown uh, Athens. And uh, ha- if I had gone to UGA the whole four years, if I had been able to do that, then I would have gone to school. I would have been there the same time as Kevin was there. We would have overlapped. Oh, wow. For two years. But we, we did. That didn't happen. But um, like I, you know, different. I was on like the concerts uh, committee and all these things when I was there. And the woman that was the oversaw that, the administrator that oversaw that, in fact, knows Kevin. Oh, wow. And uh, so there's that connection. And then a good friend of mine who I went to uh, college 
with there at UGA, his um, wife has a friend, and we were all on a, a Zoom call together, my friend and his wife and uh, her friend and some other people. This was just a couple of months ago. Mm-hmm. And uh, they, uh, my friend said, oh, tell us about uh, this, your, this brother you just found out about. Yeah, yeah. As I was describing all this, the wife's friend said, oh, you're talking about Kevin Cook. I know wow. Kevin Cook. <laughs> wow. You know. And that helps cl- and, and bring the circles closer. Yeah, that absolutely. You have, yeah. Uh, uh, similar friends and, and acquaintances that makes it little more, uh, uh, what's the, I don't know, the, but, but some more recognizable. You're, you're able to right, understand right. the community. Well, yeah, another sort community. of another uh, reveal that everything is way more inconne- interconnected than one might think otherwise. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. That, now, the thing I always find fascinating as well is hearing you on your radio show and you, you offer anecdotes and so forth. And now, so uh, we'll be go- getting to your uh, history there with the band in Atlanta because I'm fascinated with that area. I've been down there in the early '90s, but I didn't get to experience it as much as I wanted to. So we were just were you playing going. shows? Yeah, we were coming through. We were in. Um, we stopped in South Carolina, and then mm. we came down and we spent a day, two days in um, Athens. And uh, unfortunately, we didn't we we didn't get to play the 40 watt. We wanted to. Yeah, uh, things just didn't work out. So we hung out there, and we just wanted to experience everything that was there. We and so that was in the nineties. In uh, ninety one, I believe ninety no ninety three ninety three. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. I was there at the record store. Yes. Oh well, we <laughs> we were just two ships in the night. Two ships in the night. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's absolutely. It was really fun. We were out. We were glad to experience. Then we went down to uh, Tuscal. Um, Tallahassee, we played okay. big out. I know, uh, uh, Laura, I forget the name of the venue, uh, Sluggos. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. That, that's in Pensacola. Yeah, Pensacola. Yeah, we were. Yeah, we played Sluggos a number of times, and they had different locations, but. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah, they moved a couple of times. Yeah, because I looked it up just for kicks. I wanted to see, but they had moved to another area. So, but now uh, your knowledge of music is it's well known. You 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 know the ins and outs, the, the layers of everything. So tell me about when growing up, what was your first recollection? What type of, uh, as far, the, the thing that gave you the, the, the bit you as far as music? What did you, you know, it was remember? interesting when you were mentioning uh, different uh, sort of how do people, you know, how do they develop, the, you know, the sort of a love for music and there's a brother upstairs smoking pot or, or what, you know, what's going on. And then, at my house, it was it was just about completely music less, in fact. And um, my, uh, I remember, I guess it was like 71 or 72, 73, my mother was real adamant about getting a, uh, like a cabinet stereo. Yeah. And my father was really against that. It's like, when do you got to get records? You know, <laughs> buy more stuff. <laughs> yeah. and, um, and she was real adamant that it have an eight track player because right. that was the thing of the future was the A oh, track, yeah. right? Yeah. And so they they invested money in this cabinet, uh begrudged my father very begrudgingly did, and uh the uh eight track collection was the soundtrack to two thousand one A Space Odyssey. Oh wow. John Denver's greatest hits and Elvis at the Hollywood Bowl. Oh yeah, yeah. And then that was it. Oh, and wow. then uh years, years later um, in a bookcase, I found that uh, my dad had had like a two LP set of uh, Lead Belly's recordings, one LP yeah. being missed. And then there was uh, a Parlophone. Uh, these must have been my mother's 45s, like a Parlophone version of a, a couple of Beatles singles. And that, so that was that was it there. You know, we did listen to the radio, uh, AM radio. My mom did uh, like in the kitchen things like that yeah so my my whole thing was um like my grandparents had given me like a a a radio and i and 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 just tuning in and finding radio stations and uh every year i guess beginning i don't know what nowadays it's not uncommon for people to uh or families to do the video like christmas morning right you know right now now of course with with, uh, uh their phones and stuff but uh, I don't know if you ever heard of this, 
But again, it was like 70, 71 for a couple years running. My mom had gotten a tape recorder and, uh, you know, you put the cassette in and it was like a, like a, I can't get the thing, like a box, like a rectangle. And it had an external microphone that yeah. you could plug in and plug out. And her idea was we're going to preserve these uh, Christmas mornings uh, with the, yeah. the, 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 like the soundtrack to Christmas mornings. And, um, so we set it up a, a couple of years and then we later we listened back and it's like, you can't tell what's going on. It's just, Oh my gosh, I can't believe it. Yay. And yeah. a bunch of <laughs> paper rustling yeah, yeah. and then a lot of mumbling. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. and, and so it's, it, so it was got, uh, used a couple of times and stuck off into this closet. And, uh, so I had thought about it and there was at that point, it hadn't even occurred. I didn't even realize you could buy records Like buying a record you know, had like a little, um, you know, like those elementary school kind of uh, turntables, you know, right, right. kind of like they can run in a post-apocalyptic world. Yeah, you know, yeah, like heavy, heavy duty. duty. <laughs> it was like we had, you know, I had one of those was quite not as, not as sturdy, but a similar thing. It was one speaker in the front and uh, the records I played on that were like storybook records, right? right. Yeah. And so I was, but I was listening to the, uh, to the radio and, um, so I started, so I was allowed to use this tape recorder if I promise not to break it because it's a very important piece of machinery. You're going to have to use it again sometime. Which oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I just started recording stuff of off of like a clock radio and other little radios and uh, making tapes that way that I could, could listen to things. And, uh, and, uh, and then, well, so there are two epiphanies that occurred. One was, and I would listen – uh, to the American Top 40 Casey case, I'm counting things down, you're yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, and I started yeah. realizing that why is it that the songs I like never seem to do any better? They never seem to go very far on this chart. You know, they always, you know, I keep rooting for my songs, but they never seem to improve. You know, they, they kind of get stuck in the mid or whatever. It's rare right. for the songs that I like to do better. And then I realized that there was this whole left end of the dial that was just playing all this great stuff. Now we did in Atlanta, we had what was called Fox 97, which was a, the oldies channel. And at that point, oldies meant uh, 60s right. and some 50s, but you know, it was programmed really to be uh, for, a, for a housewife, 47 year old housewife. Sure. You know? And, uh, but it did play all, all lots of Beatles stuff and the things that were outright rock and, wouldn't come on as often, you know, but I had my tape recorder for that. Yeah. So there was that. And there was also this channel 96 uh, rock that uh, Lee Abrams, and I can't think of what the other guy's name is, but it was their guinea pig station for destroying what they destroyed a rock and roll radio with AOR. But that was the, right. that was their flagship format station was there. And then, um, but I discovered that here on the left end of the dial, the, the non-commercial stations, which just completely blew my mind. There was Radio Free Georgia, wow. which started every morning off with blues, Monday through Friday was blues music and lots of bluegrass. And then uh, there was a WRAS in Atlanta, which was a call it the only, became the only 100,000 watt full power uh, call, non-commercial college radio station wow. in the nation. And a WREK, Georgia Tech's uh, radio station, but specifically, WRS had these great uh, music shows. Uh, there was Reeling in the Years and uh, Flashback, and both were kind of misnamed. The Flashback show was 50s and early 60s rock and roll, and the Reeling in the Years was uh, like uh, late 60s, early uh, 70s. You know, right. you'd think those, those things would be, yeah. the things would have been flopped. <laughs> But uh, but so I was that's why I first heard uh, Bo Diddley and it was, wow. that was a mind ex expand blowing thing you know it was I'm a man and it sounded so so visceral and so raw and, uh, and you know by that point I mean I, I was buying records and uh, I had Devo records and you know sort of punk stuff new wave stuff right but nothing hit me as uh, as I was hearing these uh, older songs that just seemed to be much more in, uh, intense to me that's uh, yeah anyway and so um found out uh, it took a, quite a while to figure out the, who was it that they played because you know when they would back announce on these college stations it was hard to figure out what was going on and right. they didn't always yeah. answer the phone yeah. and, <laughs> and uh, when i got through one time and i asked this there was this great song he's going i'm a man and the woman laura i can't think what her last name is was a DJ for many years and she went to do, she actually went on to do, had other success in the music business like, um, 
like rap kind of kind of stuff working with rap artists but mm-hmm. she had this uh her came from a really large family and so she grew up with all these these old records and so she yeah. knew all this stuff right and anyway i asked her uh, i'm a man you know what that was just completely blew my mind and so she said, oh yeah, I was playing that for you. No, 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 no problem. I put it playing in the, like the next five minutes or so. And so I'm sitting there, got my little tape recorder ready to go. Oh, you know, yeah. oh my God, I'm gonna. And she played the Yardbirds version, which I had oh. heard before, and it's just fine, but it didn't have the same yeah. kind of thing, you know. And, yeah. and so then it took like weeks and weeks before I could get back again to you know to get through to say what you know that's not the one that's not the one i want and it yeah. was like oh you mean bo diddly and i was like oh of course oh. yeah whatever that is play them yeah play them <laughs> wow so so in, in essence and you you're um your your background with with music came through you were scouring the scouring the radio waves yes listening for, and did, did you ask me originally what was the first records i had yeah bought? Yeah. Okay, so the first album I bought was Charlie Daniels' Million Mile Reflections because it had The Devil Went Down to Georgia on it. Right, yeah. Right, and, right? and so that was like, however old I was, it was intimidating to walk up, you know, with a record. And I was, you know, my parents were completely chastising me like, what the hell, you're throwing your money away on that? You could hear that on the radio. Oh, yeah. Why, why would you spend money on that? Right, yeah. <laughs> and the first single I bought was uh, uh, Styx Renegade. Right, yeah. It was, yeah. Yeah, I remember that. That, that, um, so, so then with the vinyl, then you just started. In fact, I could sing that to you right now. Nice, you know. Spare, that... <laughs> I'm going to spare all your listeners that. You know, <laughs> it's, yeah, I, I, I just discovered growing up in Pennsylvania that that where we were we were there was southern music and then there was the north the Mason Dixon line right there so you had a cross very um, influence or whatever but the one thing I always noticed and my one of my introductions to to, to southern uh, uh, like just the blues and stuff one of the funnels was through Leonard Skinner and I've always remembered about those guys the way they bent their notes, even though I was a young kid and I was too, too, I didn't understand it. There was somebody, a buddy of mine from Kentucky, we were talking about this and he said, there's an extra, there's an extra layer going on somewhere that, that musicians that have the blues background or I don't know how these guys, where they got it from, you know, just like how you growing up and you, you, these things, they just come out into the music. And I was, we would have these discussions. Do you find that, um, a background in in blues or or um, uh, that it it always always uh, no matter what style of music you're playing that there there are ways you bend the notes or ways you inflect the vocals. Do you find that something that have you ever thought about that or not? You know where uh, those influences come out in your music or I mean clearly you guys you're very soulful and and. Uh, well, I mean, so um, when we formed, let's say, uh, the the Woggles, I mean, we were wanting to, you know, there's music that we enjoy and influences that we have, but, you know, we live our own lives and have our own experiences. Yeah, There's yeah. certainly sounds and uh, sort of, a, you know, there's, you know, that's a, a scaffolding, a framework that we like working with within. I don't know that any of that is, uh, you know, it's not, not, it's not that conscious or formulaic normally to be aware of that. Right. I mean, you're doing something that, that just just seems seems right. Yeah. And then afterwards you can say, Oh, all right. Well, yeah, I didn't, you know, I wasn't aware of this at the time, but, but yeah, but that certainly is an aspect of what we have going on. I, I did, well, we, you know, the band had been together for a few years and, and uh, we were, this was, I guess, in the in the mid nineties. And we were on this label that was based in Bellingham, Washington called Estrus Records. And right. there was kind of a, periodically there are these garage rock uh, revivals that come and go. And uh, at, during that one, we were, uh, I mean, you know, we would do we were doing songs, and uh, a lot of the tunes we were covering were done by uh, Southern garage bands in in the 
in the 60s. I and mean, we covered the Tamron's Wild Man and the Paragons, uh, ABBA. Both of those were like uh, North Carolina bands. Mm-hmm. And we did little Phil in the Night Shadow, 60 Second Swinger. That was like an, 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 an Atlanta band. But when we were meet these other contemporary bands, it was it was interesting that it's like um, they just didn't they didn't have the same uh, you know it, it was it was a lot it was much more act act music you know you know yeah. just and it didn't really have a it's like swing, a, a swing to it you yeah. know or a groove to it yeah. and it's like man that's 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 an important part of this. I yeah. mean, uh, you I think know, it's I, like, it was the guy, and, I, and like, I love all the uh, Pebbles and Nuggets compilations, but it, that, it was like those guys learning from that as a first, uh, a first door to, let's say, 60s kind of pop rock stuff, garage rock stuff, right. but not realizing that, uh, we well, you know, all those bands at the time, it was all the, you know, they were drawing all inspiration from the, from the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, and then the ones that, were uh, you know really turned on by this stuff? Would pay attention to what what the Stones were covering, and then would right. go back and, and find that stuff. And I, at least at that point, let's say in the nineties, I just felt like a lot of those bands were um, they were fine, you know, were, were good, and uh, some of the songs were were, were, were very catchy, uh, but they it was just it was like kind of a stunted thing. It's like man, you know, yeah. You gotta have. There's just the the, root, the roots are a little deeper uh, with this, you know, and then it's just just right, opens right. up this, you know, just the songwriting and and everything too. And I went to college now. Around that time is when you formed the right. Wobbles. That was about 1987, and that yeah. was the uh, we all every, at that time everybody was at uh, that was WUOG in Athens, and yeah. all the uh, people there and the band at that time originally all worked at the radio station. Right, and. Uh, you know, the there were no local bands. There was, the Athens music scene was was great at that time, but there weren't any bands really locally that were doing the kind of stuff that we really enjoyed. So, like the Flesh Tones would come through uh, periodically, and so would, uh, from Boston, the the Liars would come through, mm. and uh, the Flat Dua Jets were uh, actually in North Carolina, and the, there was a brief time that they were based in Athens, but most of the time they were in North Carolina. And uh, so there really wasn't anything that we felt like was really rock and roll, um, you know, sort of uh, our potpourri of rock and yeah, rock, yeah. rock and roll gumbo, right? And and that's that's when we formed the band in '87. '87. Yeah. So, so now that label you mentioned in, uh, in uh, Seattle, that was your first first label. Uh, well, so locally, we kinda... had record. There was a guy uh, that ran uh, was a bu- music buyer at Wug Street Records in Athens, mm. and he started a local label called Zontar Records. Okay. And so we put out uh, the first two singles on Zontar, and uh, he was getting those sold through the mail order of the guy. One of the places he had them sold was the mail order of uh, Dave Kreider at Estrus Records, which was in uh, Bellingham, so north of Seattle. And um, so the third one that we did, uh, uh, the Zontar guy sent, uh, you know, a tape to him, or maybe he actually literally just played it over the radio, uh, over the telephone, maybe. But in any event, uh, Estrus really wanted to put out the third single, and uh, which they did. And um, then he wanted to record an album, and we, we went out there to record the, the first yeah. album. And that Yes, yeah, so we recorded that in 92, and then it came out in 93. Now, and one then of the, the second album is a collection of these recordings we had made for Zontar, mostly, and that came out in 94. 94. So now, one of the cool things I like is uh, most recently, I so saw you out here in L.A. here uh, about two years ago. I, I'm trying to post pre-pandemic. It's hard yeah, to right, right, imagine. Hard. And, and at the Hi-Hat? Is that yeah, at the means? Hi-Hat, and then one other show. Now, uh, one thing I always dig is how you guys, you, you, you have your mo- stage moves and you guys sync up and you do some really cool stuff. Is, was that just something that you guys all growing up that you said, man, this is something we got to do? Because you're a show, obviously, anyone that, that hasn't seen the Woggles or listened to their music, they're high energy, high octane, man. So I'm just curious on uh, uh, how you guys uh, 
it's just it's just really fun it just brings the brings the whole the whole thing together man you dudes you're not just standing up there playing you're playing right. man. You're well, it's definitely an idea of putting on a show that that's definitely there i mean anybody wants to just listen to the records i mean they could just stay home and listen just, to a record yeah, you know? exactly <laughs> so we could play the, and plus you know the, so the records too um they'll be you know we can't always replicate sure. somebody's horn parts or some the keyboard parts and uh, there's, you know, just the economics of having uh, traveling around won't, won't allow that. Yeah. So there has to be some other element there, right? Yeah. Um, and so that other, other other element is putting on the show and uh, and taking it off the stage and to the people and yeah. uh, jumping yeah. on the bar, walking. Out. <laughs> right. Keep keeping it moving. Keeping it moving, man. Yeah. Don't give them a stationary target, Nick. That's you never right. know when they may turn on you. You got to keep. <laughs> Bobbing and weaving, right? <laughs> exactly. Much safer that way. Yeah. So, so now getting back to uh, uh, the, the records you purchased as a as a youngster, and then what were some of the uh, when you started going to see uh, live bands in in the genre now that you or whatever any yeah. what were some of the early acts that you uh, that influenced you or. Well, so uh, you know, I I go uh, I guess those first two years I was at. Georgia State, I did see, you know, it was like a commuter school. So that's a whole weird yeah, thing. It's, it's not, yeah. you know, and so I'm still living at home. And uh, I did go to some shows, but I really wasn't uh, hip enough to know what was going on in like the local clubs and, yeah. and stuff. And uh, then, two, so those first two years, so then the next two years, I when I went to the University of Georgia at Athens, they had all, you know, the nightlife there was really just uh, developing. Right. And uh, so there, but there were, you mentioned the 40 Watt, there's also the Uptown Lounge and places where local bands would play. And I started, you know, frequenting those haunts. And, and uh, you know, the first time I saw the uh, the Liars was at the uh, 40 Watt. And, um, and so that, that was pretty intense. But the, I guess the, the first sort of rock and roll act that I saw that sort of was a quintessential sort of, energy thing right where there was just non-stop was uh was the flesh tones playing at this place called the uptown lounge and uh they at one point the uh, guitar player case string is on one side of the room and he's up there's like a narrow ledge where people could set their drinks on right so they wouldn't have to have tables there right so he's he's sort of precariously balanced on this little railing on against the wall <laughs> and then the other side is um peter's room the front man up on a tabletop yeah and they're doing this call and response back and forth across the the room wow. and um then uh, they empty out the club go out into the street and there's all this call and response stuff and people chanting and then they bring it back into the club and i had never seen anything like that right and i was right. my mouth was completely dropped and <laughs> like a Tex Avery cartoon, yeah. you know? and uh, I'm like, my God, this 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 is incredible. This is everything that right, you know, the the energy is matched with the the physicality, and uh, and so this guy that uh, at that time his name was uh, David Giles, and he ran Ruthless Records in, in Athens a store there, and he did. Um, this was before the Woggles existed, and he did. Um, Later joined the, the Woggles as a rhythm guitar player, took the stage name of Mr. Moto. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, but I only knew him at that point as the guy, the guy that runs a record store, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and you know, I was just like, oh my God, this is the most incredible show I've ever seen in my life. And I looked at him and, and he's like, he's, well, I guess you like that, huh? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, <laughs> they've kind of peaked. They were much better three or four years ago. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, ironic, you know. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, sure, David. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. They, they were. I, I got to see them finally out here at uh, Pappy and Harriet's, and oh man, yeah, like whoo, it just was a, a whole nother level, man. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And, um, and so, and also as far as with the uh, working at at the, it's Wuxtry, right? Is that the, yes. the label? I mean the uh, record the, uh, store. record store. Yeah, and I'm sure you 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 met a lot of interesting people coming through those doors in the time you worked there. Well. Oh yeah. You know, it's funny. So, um, Robin Hitchcock, I thought this was brilliant. So there was a, 
you know, like all these record stores, the, the window space has got all these posters on it. Yeah. And, I, and Robin Hitchcock's going to play the 40 watt. And um, on the front door facing out, right? So if you're walking in the door, here's, here's the front door, you, you see the poster. So it's right. on the inside. And then we would push the door, you know, in and people walk past the open door. But you could clearly see. Uh, this Robin Hitchcock poster, and it would say uh, where the 40 watt, what the date was. Right. And so the poster's there on, on the door, and Robin Hitchcock uh, comes in. Again, this must have been, uh, this was another Michael Stipe thing. I think they were hanging out together and they oh, walked sure, in. Sure. And uh, the owner is there again. And this is funny that he's appeared in, in uh, all three of these stories when, when normally, <laughs> you know, he wouldn't be there. Right, right. right. <laughs> but he was. And, uh, he saw, oh, we got Robin Hitchcock in here, and he's thinking, what can I get him to? What can I get him to sign, right? Yeah, yeah. And so he, uh, we didn't have any Robin Hitchcock, but we had the poster. So he ran over to the sharpie and said, "Hey, Robin, can you can you sign that poster for us?" And Robin Hitchcock looked around. And he said, "Sure." And so he walked over to the glass door <laughs> and signed the glass one, <laughs> handed back the sharpie, and said, "See, see you later. Uh, oh, <laughs> see you later." <laughs> he walked out. Holy Which God. is not what uh, you know the owner had expected there, but again, right. he was like took it in stride. It was like, well, we just won't wash the window for a while. Yeah, but it wasn't yeah. like we washed them that often anyway. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think that it, working at the store now, uh, getting back to your your online uh, or your um, uh, radio career, is that where you develop you, you, your encyclopedia knowledge of music, or is it? Uh, because you really, you really bring a lot of cool information. Well, thanks, Nick. But I mean, the internet certainly helps, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but no, I and when I was went to uh, UGA those first two years, I was working at the college radio station. Actually, I'd started working at the college oh, you radio worked station okay. at WRES. Right. So you know, um, I did. I never got to do the flashback show, but I did fill in before on the reeling in the years, which was a a, a big thing for me. Mm. Uh, and from there, I got they put me on the air. They, in, fact, in fact, now I remember that's where I first heard the first heard the liars. So that was an epiphany too, where it was like, oh my god, this is that that visceral element, and it's you know um, just like this the sixties music that I was enjoying. It it was, and I realized, oh my god, you so. You know, you could be here now and have music that, that has that same in, in kind of intensity. For me, what I inter interpret sure. as the intensity. So that was, oh, my God, I can't believe these, this exists. You know, and this is a new band, you know, and, it, and it's not them covering an old song or trying to be slavish to that era. You, you know, the guys in the band uh, aren't dressed up in Beetle Boots, you know, which I happen to like. But the yeah, point yeah, is, yeah. they're not trying to look like that. They're just making timeless rock and roll. So that's where I had discovered the liars, right? And that's like, oh, you know, who I did not see until later when I was uh, actually in Athens. Oh, okay. But so that's where I started on the radio, and then when I uh, moved went, moved to Athens and went to school up there, then I got involved in the college radio station up there. So I went from WRAS to WUOG, and that's where wow. the band started and so forth. And so I, you know, my favorite things to do. Um, uh, well, at UOG, I. What did I do? I became the assistant program director and then program director over time. And, and we had a lot of great specialty shows. And that's, that's where my real love gravitated. I used to do a, a weekly blues show called Blue Laws, which I've always thought was a great name. Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. It was on Sundays, <laughs> right? So Blue Laws on Sundays. Perfect, yeah. Perfect. And uh, I did that for a long while. And then when I could, I would fill in on the, uh, the oldies show, which was called Who Put the Bomb? And that was just a mixture of 50s and uh, 60s rock and roll stuff. Oh, wow, yeah. And then, yeah. of course, yeah, being around all that uh, music, you pick up all the different... Uh, right, you're reading all the li liner notes when liner yeah. notes would be a thing and looking at, uh, you know, who wrote the songs. And, yeah. uh, oh, my gosh, I can't believe this was a, was a cover. I've got to find out, you know, who, who did this originally, you know? Right. Uh, now, also, one of, one of the songs you guys do is that you cover uh, Chubby Checker, Karate Monkey. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah that's so a, that was a 25-cent fine at a thrift store. I was no it? Idea. Yeah, I just saw, you know, when you see a title that says Karate Monkey, yeah, it's, it's like, like oh, I've got to hear what this is. <laughs> i got to hear what this is. And yeah. now the funny thing about that was, um, 
so I got the the band to do it. And first, you know, I mentioned uh, Speedy John, John Carlucci a few months oh, yeah. ago. Yeah. And so we had a band here in L.A. that was just like a one-off thing. We called it the Odd Squad. But we covered uh, karate. Uh, we did the karate monkey. Um, and then <laughs> the uh, Woggles, we were going to do this, uh, uh, wanted to do a uh, like a, a soul 10-inch record, just a bunch of soul covers on a on a 10 inch. And, uh, that was, you know, I, we'd already done this. I knew it was possible to do the song and, uh, brought it to the Woggles and said, let's, you know, let's, let's do that. And everybody was uh, amenable. And so we, we recorded the song and, um, little Steven just freaked out. I mean, yeah. totally <laughs> freaked out. And, uh, and then he was so disappointed when he, when he found out we didn't write the song. Oh, no. <laughs> then he was so angry at himself that he, that he didn't know that it was a Chubby Checker song. Ah, was yeah. Like, How can yeah. I? Because he used to work, you know, on the uh, oldie circuit there. He played by, uh, behind the, uh, the Dovells, I think. He went down to Florida, working oh, wow. some kind of oldies, just playing music, you know, r- right in the early – uh, 70s. Early 70s, yeah. And that's in, got his moniker, Miami Steve, I think, from those, from well, those that's days. That's the connection from down there, okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, he went down there and he came back, I guess, uh, dressed in a very uh, flashy way. And so they were like, oh, look at Miami Steve. But, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Something to that effect. Anyway, yeah, yeah. but so, yeah, so Karate Monkey was a 25-cent uh, thrift store find. And uh, when I would look it up, in discographies, this was before Discogs. It never, it never was there. I was like, how, how could, how, how could this be? It's such a, such a, it's a little bit of everything, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, uh, mostly I, fun. Mostly fun. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I thought I knew, I thought I knew mo- a lot. Yeah, a lot of the chubby checker stuff. Yeah. And I was like, oh man, that's cool. That is very cool. So I could, it made me explore a little more on chubby checkers because I saw him in Vegas once, about five or five, about seven or eight years ago, and uh, yeah, he's. He's still, uh, he's, he has a lot of fun on stage. So, yeah. Great. Yeah. But, uh, so now, let's see. So, Karate, what year did that roughly, until you joined the Wicked Cool label? Was that? that was oh, awesome. so what happened was, um, you know, we, uh, so in 2003, we lost our guitar player, uh, George Montague Holton the third. Right. Big man, yeah. big long name. Long name, yeah. Very, yeah. very cool, sweet guy. And yeah. we had done a record uh, with Telstar Records that was called Ragabit Right. And so he actually passed away right before that record, mm. uh, right before that record came out. And um, so the Flesh Hammer, Jeff Walls, Jeff Walls, he had produced that album and he had produced not everything we had done, but a lot of uh, the rec- recordings that we had done. And he had also sat in. Sometimes when we had played shows, he'd actually filled in for uh, for George uh, a couple of times. And uh, so it was kind of pretty much in the family, right? And so, uh, and he wanted to, to step up to the plate and we were more than uh, happy to have him there, right? Yeah, I mean, he's a, yeah. he, was, he was a phenomenal oh, guitar yeah. player. And Absolutely. I don't, I don't think he ever gets enough uh, kudos for his production abilities, but th- he was really great. And so he joined the band right after that, and that's when we went to uh, uh, Rick Miller uh, from Southern Culture on the Skids. He's got a studio uh, in Mebane, uh, North Carolina, outside of Chapel Hill. Mm. And he had, uh, we had done Ragabit right there, and he was like, well, why don't you guys come do the new record at my place, and we'll do it on spec, meaning that uh, we wouldn't have to pay him anything, but if you know, somebody puts it out, he, he would get reimbursed for all the uh, studio time. Right. And uh, he was thinking that uh, we would be able to get that out on uh, Yep Rock Records. Right. That's what he, he had a good relationship with them. And he was thinking that's how it would play out, which, you, but you know, it didn't. Right. And uh, for what, a, but it didn't. And around that time, uh, little Steven was trying to get his label up off the ground. And we had gone and played in New York and he was uh, curating or, if he wasn't curating, he was definitely being the uh, announcer, what do you call it, uh, master ceremony. Yeah, master of ceremonies, yeah. At these Cave Stop shows in New York, sure. which was this garage rock package shows uh, using a newer uh, cont- contemporary garage rock bands and putting them with some, uh, some older bands. And um, so we went up there, and the 
one, the only one that he didn't curate or didn't uh, act as a master of ceremonies yeah. was the one that we, we played, uh, which we have to play with the remains who were phenomenal, were just, you know, note for note, it was just phenomenal, wow. right? Yeah. They, you know, this was killer. Uh, and uh, so then we would go back and uh, there's sort of like the circles of mutual friends. People tra kept trying to get him to the shows and it just wasn't working out. So finally, we did a show at the South Paw. I think that was the name of the place there in uh, Brooklyn. And this club had it was, was quite a curtain in front of it, well, in front of the stage, you know. Yeah. And I can't, we either played with Lost Straight Jackets or we played with uh, the Detroit Cobras. I can't recall which. And, uh, but, you know, so we were opening and um, it was just kind of silly, his, uh, and a fun silly, but his, some of his friends and his personal assistant were like, he, he's on his way. He, he's, he's on his way. It's like, okay, whatever. You know, yeah, yeah. either here, he's not here. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, right now I have to perform for the yeah, yeah, yeah. Audience, right? And our fans that come back, you know, right. I hope he does come, but. You know, say la vie. Yeah. And uh, but and it was a really killer. It was a really killer show. You know, um, and it, it was a great show. And uh, but you know, we we're opening, so we got to clear the stage as you know quickly as possible. And this place had the the dressing room was down downstairs. Like you came off the exited stage right. As Snaggletooth would say, and you'd yeah, yeah, yeah. ride down the steps and oh, the, yeah, yeah. the green room down there, dressing room down there. And so I'm, you know, sweating from head to toe, and I've got my tambourine and yeah, my, yeah. my harmonicas, you know, uh, in the wrong cases and whatever, <laughs> and can jumbled up. And I'm coming down the steps, and the, there he is, you know, there's there's a man, and uh, and he's got this little chuckle on his face. He's like smiling ear to ear. He's really, yeah. really, really happy. And uh, and uh, I said, oh, hi, you must be Stephen. And he was like, oh, yeah, you know, you guys are great. He actually said some really nice things. He said, uh, I saw the Beatles at Shea Stadium. I saw the Rolling Stone with the Brian Jones, Eric Burden with the Animals, Sam and Dave. Those are the ones he mentioned. And he said, and you guys got it. I mean, you really got it. I'm not wow. just here blowing smoke, Rand. You guys really got it. Yeah, and I guess yeah. I was so pumped up from the show because that was – you know, that yeah, wasn't really, man. it was, everything was on. And as you know, so yeah, you yeah. could be, you're your own worst critic. I mean, there are times when you know that, man, I really sucked. And what is it with all these people telling me how great it was? Because I know it was sucked. <laughs> but you also know, Nick, you can't tell them that it sucked as bad as you think it sucked because then they'll be crushed. Yeah, right? you can't yeah, say you can't yeah. go, Oh yeah, that was great. And then there's awesome. other times you come off stage and you're like, I just had the best show in the world. And nobody gives you any accolades at all. And you feel like, well, you're not paying attention to my brilliance. I was the greatest I've ever been. Yeah, yeah. How many times? I've never been as good as I was tonight. Did you not notice that? But they don't, they don't give you that, right? Yeah. Well, so this moment, I, I felt that, that lift from everything being right. And the guy, Stephen's like, obviously, he's like, yeah, I, yeah, this, this is great. He says those nice things. And then I yeah. put my hand on his shoulder and I said, well, that's great. But what are you going to do about it, buddy? <laughs> and uh, and I guess because you know maybe I, I probably wouldn't have done that yeah. if I hadn't been you know like yeah this, you're, you're right it's it right and he wasn't expecting that so we got the he's like oh holy <laughs> his eye was short circuiting <laughs> right like ah yeah. uh, you know while I say so he's kind of goes into this kind of soprano thing well I got you know I got the yeah, label yeah. and uh, yeah, I'm gonna yeah. try to get this label off the ground and yeah, I was yeah. like well I'm waiting you know I'm late, man. <laughs> I mean. The record's done, buddy. You that's know, right. Let's get moving. Uh, Quit wasting my time. That's right. Yeah. That's right. You, you, well, we're going to do it. Hang in there. Hang in there. Hang in there. And uh, and so that's that's how that uh, happened. You know, the uh, Yep Rock didn't didn't want the record, and um, so uh, and Stephen's label was starting up still. So we had there was a you know wait time of a few months in between yeah, there yeah. before that that was that was gonna that was gonna happen. And um, around that time too, and I. I'm not because we're just I'm talking off the top of my head here. I haven't really thought this through, but around in this time uh, was the whole thing of come uh, come be on the be on the radio too. So we had done come back. To, we had done this. Uh, he had a Randall's Island uh, festival. Little Stephen did, and he did have it's like sixteen thousand people showed up. And I it was, have seen stuff. right. 
but at the same, so so there there were these cool aspects to it, and it was also like everything that possibly go wrong went wrong with it, you know. Sure. So the lineup is phenomenal. So there the the Stooges and there and Bo Diddley and wow. the, you know surviving members of the creation and and all these the key, you know we mentioned the flesh tones and the liars and there's the cynics and there's um, all these other great, you know, they're swinging neck breakers and uh, probably the insomniacs. I can't recall offhand if they were there as well, but it seems yeah, like yeah. just about everybody. Buck and the Myers wow. was there at the same thing. I mean, there's all all these great contemporary garage rock bands and all this, this these great bands from uh, before. And uh, there was also a, a hurricane, like off the coast. <laughs> yes, <you know? laughs> All the weather was yeah, really yeah. crappy. It did, it yeah. did, it did not rain like the whole time, but, but you know, it was always looming over every, over everything, sure. and, uh, and and it was raining ev- eventually, and it would sort of a little bit stop, a little bit stop. And you're like, when is it really going to unleash? Yeah, I had yeah. This cool <laughs> idea to have this spinning, uh, rotating stage. So one band is playing, and then and then behind the behind the other band is set up, and the stage is going to rotate. And so you're playing your last song as you're kind of moving <laughs> away, and then yeah. the other band is yeah. band playing oh, no. that song. You know? <laughs> well, that worked for like four bands, and then yeah. it got stuck. You know? Oh no! Yeah. And it got stuck kind of at an angle. Yeah. So uh, uh, Bruce Springsteen, this was great. The, the Bruce Springsteen that was was there, and you know he's kind of buffed up by this time, and he's yeah. well, there's no problem, Steve. Let's go down and move it. And so yeah. these guys, they're all pushing and you know <laughs> trying to move the wheel, but uh, you know they, oh, they moved it just in night. It was still off kilter, but it yeah. was you know better than what it had been. Yeah. And then uh, so the our sets get changed from. Uh, I think we were supposed to have like you know, play five songs a piece, and I got my I got moved down to like two songs, you know. Yeah. yeah. So uh, so we you know we got up and do a dead our two songs. So my point of going into all that stuff was that uh, at that event they introduced the guy, people that were going to be the uh, underground garage uh, disc jockeys for his oh. channel. And I thought to myself, wow, I really screwed up. I should have sent in a, a demo tape, you know. But yeah. But I, I blew that because I had seen an email soliciting for that, but I had never done it. And um, that uh, through the course of that day there, I spoke to his uh, personal assistant at the time, who sadly had just passed away. Yeah, uh, I saw that. Polly yeah. Ca- yeah, she yeah. was such a Polly, such a phenomenal woman, right? Yeah. So, um, but it was her. That I, I mentioned, oh, I wish I would have done that, and uh, she said, oh. Just, just send me, you know, just send me one, just send me oh, yeah, one, just yeah, do yeah. it, just do it. Yeah. You never sent one? <laughs> just, just, just do it, trust just me. Do it. <laughs> just do it. <laughs> and, uh, and so I did, and again, I never heard anything back. So let's say this festival was sometime in the middle of summer, and uh, never heard anything back, and we played that fall, either, I don't know, it was October, late September, October, early November, somewhere in there. And maybe we, we played the Mercury Lounge, and uh, I think maybe we were opening up for Holly Go Lively at the time. Wow, yeah. But in, in any event, uh, we, we played, a, it was a good show, and, and Stephen came to the show, and um, uh, afterwards he said, why don't you, you, you guys, why don't you guys come by the Sirius Studios tomorrow? And most of the time when we would be up there and playing in New York, it would just be in and out. The next day we would, we would be gone. Sure. So maybe this was a Saturday because we were going to go spend the, uh, the night at a friend's, you know, driving West into New Jersey. And then the next day we would have to drive over uh, or around, you know, Manhattan. Right. right. Uh, so, um, I asked the other guys and nobody wanted to do it. And I was like, you don't, you don't understand. He, Steve was pretty emphatic that we should come by. He, you know, this yeah. is the re- our guy, our man, record label man. It doesn't make any sense for us to, I mean, he's asked, let's, you know, they do it. So we, they find everyone finally signed on to that. And so we, we went and they were showing us around and that was you know pretty cool. It didn't seem like it was going to detain us from uh, our appointed rounds that day. So yeah. that was great. And then at some point, um, a kid Leo came out and introduced himself, and he ah. said, "Oh, he's like, hey, Manfred, uh, uh, come on in the office. Let me let me let me show you a few things." And uh, and so the other guys are following. He's like, "Oh, well, uh, points to somebody. Take take those guys down to Studio B. Show them to me. 
<laughs> something to that effect. Yeah, yeah. And he's in the office, and he, he's like, "What do you think so far?" And I said, like, "Well, is this you know, this is really great." And uh, he's like, "Okay, well, this is the clock, and you know, you play music out of these categories." And and I said, uh, "Leo, excuse me, it sounds like you're offering me a job." And his face is kind of went, what? Nobody's told you? No one told you? <laughs> I don't believe no one's told you. And then he starts <laughs> getting himself all worked up. You know, nobody's told you these things. Yeah. And uh, and at that moment, uh, Stephen walked in. And uh, he's like, hey, so what do you think? And uh, I was like, well, uh, apparently I'm being offered a job. And he's like, and then Leo's like, no, nobody told him. <laughs> and Stephen's <laughs> like, well, now you know. What, yeah, what do you yeah, think? Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I said, well, I, this, sounds, this all sounds great. Uh, you know, and uh, that, so now we're all standing in the center. We're all standing up in the center of the room, and it's a separate office. Yeah. And uh, so then Steve, it was the weirdest thing. It was like Steven's going in, you know, Sopranos are on the air at the time. And he kind of starts talking in this whisper, and his shoulders are kind of hunching up like this. And, <laughs> well, you know, uh, what do you think? Uh, we could kind of pay you. Uh, uh, you know, leaning in, trying yeah, yeah. to hear exactly <laughs> what he's saying. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I thought to myself, Wow, you know, I've never been paid that much money ever in my life for anything. So, yeah, that sounds great. But I want to play it cool, you know, because you yeah. know how you are when you're in the business. Oh, yeah. That's yeah, yeah. I said, well, you know, that, that sounds great. Uh, let me think it over. Sure, and, uh, sure. I'll get back to you next week. But I'm definitely very interested. And thanks for, uh, for showing me around and everything because I had absolutely no, I, no, no idea. No idea. Wow. And, uh, and so what followed from that is I – you know, I had sent in the original demo tape, and I came up and did another uh, show. They, you know, I, I think I had to fly back to New York, and I did a show up there. And, um, and then after that, uh, they sent me stuff to work from home. Oh, right. Yeah, you're able to. Uh, uh, right, because you're just yeah. recording voice tracks at home. Yeah, that's you gather a playlist, and then uh, after I kind of figure out what's going to be played, then I send that list to a guy in New York who puts it in the, uh, the system, organizes uh, the, the playlist. And, then and, I it's it, the, so. and I record the voice tracks and then those are dropped in afterwards. Oh, that's great. So, and then now that, so everyone that, that listens, obviously to you knows your time, but it's called the midday matinee and it's right. every, every day, uh, Monday through Friday at that's right. noon um, to 3 p.m. Noon to Eastern. 3 Eastern. Yeah. yeah. And so course, in our world, that's 9 a.m. to noon. 9 to noon, yeah. So uh, okay. so drive time, morning drive, drive time. for us. Yeah. Morning drive for us. Yeah. And, and also the other thing, uh, the, the f- other fun aspect of your job is you get uh, once a week, Stephen uh, picks the coolest song. Yeah. Uh, and plays that for a, lo- a long time. It gets a really good for, run. And then, you, right. of course, you, of course, uh, interview – so a representative from the band or perhaps a producer connected right. to the, or, or even um, uh, there are times when you'll do other, uh, like you interviewed Joe Grishecki, uh, yeah. or he was interviewed. Uh, um, so I, it's really fascinating how you guys, that, that whole coolest song in the world connects people to newer bands as well as older bands that have, uh, or that are uh, affiliated with Wicked Cool or, I'm just trying to think off the top of my head. Um, some of the bands that uh, you may not have heard in ages, they put a new song out and they have a home. Right. Well, like the Shadows of Night, you know, yeah. the Jimmy Songs, the lead singer was still active as the Shadows of Night, and they yeah. released a, recorded a new song. And so uh, Stephen really loved the song and uh, wanted to put it out, and uh, has done so. The song's called Wild Man. It's kind of autobiographical about. Yeah. Uh, about Jimmy and his escapades. And yeah. so that, 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 that's a recent one. Uh, of course, you know, other bands that are signed to the label, but then, you know, whoever, uh, whatever else he happens to fancy and wants to add uh, officially to the, to the channels. Uh, yeah. Rotation. Yeah. Next week I'll speak with a guy from the uh, yum yums, you know, as a Norwegian oh, yeah. Yeah. band uh-huh. that guy has a new release out. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. I haven't spoken to them before, so that that'll be fun. And, uh, and then, so also, so that, when you're describing the coolest conversations is what we call it, when I right, speak right. with these people, that airs on a Friday, and that's part of the regular, um, the on-air show. But then uh, I do uh, also those uh, 
A longer version of those are available as a podcast. And for the podcast, sometimes I'm interviewing some other people too, like Kathy Valentine from the Go-Go's. She right. had a big, uh, her memoir came out this year. The Go-Go's also had released a new song. So yeah. spoke with her, King Khan from, you know, King Khan of the Shrines. Right. He, uh, is, that guy's got, a, does a million different things. So the podcast was a better way to talk about all these other projects of his Go in the uh, depth more. Right. More. There's one, uh, John Densmore, Densmore from The Doors has got a new book, and he's one that I'll be doing up. Oh, wow. Oh, that's, that'll be a great one. Yeah, so you have on – no, it's on the Wicked – or, I mean, the Underground Garage website where you can access your extended uh, versions of your coolest conversations. Right, right. And those, those, those – uh, you know, after they air, they become available as podcasts, and as right. podcasts, you know, you can find them through any – podcast hosting website right you I listen think, to many podcasts yourself uh, oh yeah yeah okay yeah listen i uh yeah and there's uh when you mention that on the website there are several different um providers i don't know what they call it what the kids call them these days but you can whatever you subscribe to you what can you listen call it, you know, and there's podcast a, hosting websites yeah so <laughs> that's on the page when you go to to for all the co co coolest conversations and so forth, I just can click. Oh, okay, I have Spotify or whatever, and that's easy right. for me to. So it's pretty convenient for everybody to. Uh, SoundCloud, I think, is the other one as well. So I think that's what it's called. I enjoy listening to all. Uh, well, thanks. All these guys to talk, chatting with them and uh, getting some uh, some uh, interesting uh, uh, information. And but you and them. I, Nick, have not spoken as part of a coolest conversation. No, man. Fun. I know one of these days, man. I'll, so if we ever get one, another one, well, yeah, yeah you, it will happen. It will come to pass. All right, there we go. That's fun. It's it, that's a blast for us too. So we uh, we enjoy the support you guys give us, and which is the beautiful thing about about your station, and and you give independent people a voice too. You yeah. know, so we really appreciate that. It's. Uh, it's fun as it's fun as hell. We listen to you guys all the time, so uh, uh, we really uh, we're we're grateful for the opportunity because it's it's radio's a tough business, as we all as you know, obviously. Right. And, uh, well, so. I guess it too, you know, it's not. I mean, it's not a non-commercial channel, right? I mean, it's yeah. and it, it's also it's uh, you know Stephen's channel. It's his uh, vision. Yeah. Um, he it comes out of his syndicated radio show, right? You know, he was had the he did the syndicated show first as a way to feature rock and roll stuff and to work in newer artists, right? Yeah. It's uh, we do well. The quick story on that is he felt like none of these newer artists were getting played anywhere, and so he he uh, came up with the idea of his show mixing old and new things together yeah. and no uh, syndicator would touch it. They're like, no, this is ridiculous. If you want to get on and play, talk about Bruce Springsteen songs, we'll, you know, we'll line you up. We're not interested in going to commercial radio stations, rock stations, right. the ones that are left and, and having you play new music. Nobody gives a damn about that. Yeah. And uh, he said, no, I, I, I completely don't believe that. And so he, on his own, went to the top 10 markets and found out whatever rock station was, was there and spoke with, directly with the program directors and said, well, what's, what is your absolute worst time s slot? I'll buy that time. Yeah. You know, so that's why the program was on Sunday night. Sunday nights are like 10, usually on a lot of the iHeart channels. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah and so go. it started there. And yeah. uh, when, the, when that was, was, was successful – then when the serious thing was starting up, uh, you know, he, he pitched it to those guys and uh, then, then it became a 24 uh, seven format. Right. Yeah. He, yeah. I had heard his story on, I guess his um, hourly, um, the St Stephen sessions, I think is my, may have yeah. heard it there. What yeah. you described very interesting how he was able to, yeah, as you say, get into, go up to the, uh, upper upper uh, echelons of serious and and pitch his idea and they yeah, they yeah. rolled with it and obviously you have kid leo and and uh, and then all the great djs you guys that are on board and you uh i, I think for anyone that's that's not a that, that that discovers the station they really get a good education it's like a 101 rock and you know for me for what you guys play i'm, I'm learning new, new things every day obviously and imagine that the younger younger listeners really get a 
a, a, a real understanding of, of the, the, the history of rock and roll, you know? And yeah. Yeah. So you guys, you definitely, and, you I, and I have to say, I learn as well too, from the other DJs, especially DJs, uh, specifically, you know, Bill Kelly and, yeah. um, and he drew Carey and, uh, yeah. you know, they are playing uh, stuff that, uh, I've never heard of, and, sure. uh, and so I pick stuff out of their playlist. You know, that's what yeah. I promote their shows that way, and that gives me an opportunity to play something that maybe I normally wouldn't be able to uh, yeah. to to play. You know, yeah, you're always the, that's the beauty of it, huh? You're always discovering something new. Absolutely, as long yeah. as you keep discovering, it's, yeah. it's like you're a little kid again listening to your radio. With the- yeah, Mike, Mike Ferber, and the Bowery Boys, you stole my love. That was the most recent thing. It's a Graham Gouldman song, and it may be that his group, the Mockingbirds, even did it, You Stole My Love. But that Mike Ferber version, he was an Australian guy, it's just, ah, uh, it just says it's really raw edge to it, and it just, it's just killer. Just knocks Absolutely you out, killer, right? yeah. So yeah. that's. Of course, we were chatting uh, online recently. You're, you had recorded a new, new album. Or you were gearing up to record. You had a right. So out. we, the, so the Woggles, right before the world turned upside down on yeah. everybody, we were in New York, and uh, we were recording. I mean, it's just crazy to think that as we were going to the, you know, we would be in the studio all day, and then we would go a- afterwards out to any any dinner, yeah. and then have like a nightcap, and literally a mile away the virus is percolating, you yeah, know, and it's being yeah, spread yeah. and we're not, it's just so, so weird. But, um, I mentioned Jeff Walls, the, who's yeah. flesh hammer. So he was in the yeah, band yeah. from 2003 until he passed away uh, last year. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. um, real quick that, that was misdiagnosed. He had pancreatic cancer. Right. Uh, right. And they, at the time it's, it was a very difficult thing apparently to, to diagnose and he was misdiagnosed as needing like a double lung transplant. I remember you. Yeah. All yeah. this kind of stuff. Yeah. So uh, he passed away sadly. And then what we thought we would do is um, we would uh, enlist a lot of our guitar player friends yeah. to, uh, do work on the the next record so it featured different a lot of different guitar players and yeah. uh, first on that list was, was steven and so we went in Feb- late february to new york to record a couple of songs uh, with him and uh, so we finished those and then the idea was you know like not the next month but the month after that we were working going to be working with other people and, and recording throughout the, the balance of this year right and of course that's that that didn't happen obviously it's been push back we push that back and you know every month uh, yeah. i move that ticket airline ticket back yeah month. you just keep pushing back i was gonna say but we do have you know other people lined up to, to play on the record and we yeah. do have songs uh, lined up and so it, it'll it'll happen eventually but now your most recent single though that's with steven on guitar right? that is with steven right so the a side is called nothing more to say right that's on it's on wicked cool wicked records cool. And the B side is uh, Sweet Freedom. So the A side was written by our bass player, Buzz Hackstrom. And that's actually a cool thing to, to bring up real quickly is that yeah. the guys in the band, Buzz, uh, Buzz Hackstrom on the bass, and Dan Electro on the drums, uh, those guys are also, I mean, everybody writes songs in the band. Right. You guys all write. Yeah. Right. And so, uh, and recently, uh, out of the songs that we've written, uh, Buzz's songs have been Stephen's favorites. Right. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I've noticed and, it as far as writing. Yeah. Right. And so uh, before that, it was um, the Dan, the drum, the drummer Dan. He's always liked his songs, uh, and you know, and sometimes my songs, and sometimes uh, Jeff's songs. Sure. But it's yeah. but it's interesting that you know. So definitely, most recently, uh, Patrick uh, Buzz Buzz Hagstrom is a stage name. His songs have been the ones that Stevens want, wants to do. And so that, that is the A side. And then as the B side, that Sweet Freedom is a uh, Barry Mann, Cynthia Weil song. And uh, years ago, several years ago, I had said to Steven when he had did this album with Darlene Love, uh, Mann and Weil had uh, su- submitted this song. And so she did the song on the album. And also I had, yeah, that's right, did the song on the album. And I met them 
when he uh, brought Darlene Love or had her play at the Whiskey out here in, uh-huh. in L.A. And I was seated at a, at a table with them. And they're my favorite grill building songwriters. And yeah. it was so loud in there. I mean, we was sort of like, hello, hello. And that was yeah, about yeah. as much That's conversation it. as we had. <laughs> and they did say a couple of things about how proud of their daughter they were. And, and, uh, and uh, I guess their daughter, I can't at this moment, I can't remember what her daughter was involved in. But they were very proud parents. Yeah. And uh, we talked about that. And then, you know, it was too loud for anything else. But uh, since I knew that he had his relationship with him, I was wondering if they had done some song that uh, the Animals or Paul Revere didn't do some rocking song that had never gotten issued. And I really wanted to do It's like, that would be perfect for us, yeah, right? What, yeah. a, what a great a great thing, I yeah, thought. Yeah. It was, so, uh and I asked Stephen about that, and uh, apparently his relationship with him had gotten kind of tenuous. They had they had submitted a song for the uh, that's the mailman is delivering over there. So Charlie's administering the. Um, that's right. So you know we we'll have to. It'll be a you know he's going to go up the street, and then Charlie will stop barking, and then he'll come back down the street. Right. Yeah. And then he'll start again. <laughs> Uh, so, but let, I need to finish, get through the story though, because this, the, this, this is a good one. So you have yeah. to deal with having Charlie. Sure, that's moment. fine. Okay. So, um, he, it's, they had submitted a song for Darling Love, but, but Stephen didn't like it. It was like, this, this song is, is, it's like, this, I want, I want songs that are really driving. We don't want to be, we don't, it's the, the song he said was fine. It's called like Soul Survivor. But this isn't an album about her being a survivor. This is an album about her being uh, immediate, you know, right. like she's now. now. She's not hanging on from before. Right. So, I, I, so he told him that he didn't want that uh, song. And, and uh, one or the other was not very happy about that. You know, the song was, in effect, being rejected. And so he asked for something else. And the, what they gave him was this Sweet Freedom song. Hmm. And um, so... Leading up to the our recording session with him, he picked the the A side, nothing more to say, and there were another half dozen demos, and he was you know sort of like, well, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, and literally when we came into the studio, he said, well, you wanted to do this a Man Wild song, how about this Sweet Freedom song? Do you? And I said, well, I I remember you did it on the album, and it's it's like really a horn driven thing, and he it's like what what are you thinking, you know? And he's like, no, 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 we'll just do it. Do it like a straight up uh, uh, rock rock and roll thing, and I said, "Okay, yeah. well let's let's give that a shot." And that came out really really well. Wow. And in fact, yeah, the yeah. the band normally you know doesn't. Ju- we've never gone into the studio and, and said, uh, "Hey, here's a song. Listen to it and let's do it." You know, so that that was the first time. Yeah, wow. I mean, it was the they uh, the guy saw the song or heard the song a couple of times, and then it's like we well, hear the chords, and we played through it for like twenty minutes, and then we recorded it. You know. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. But so it was like we were like professional musicians who knew what they were doing or something. Yeah. It was just terrifying. <laughs> you know, a dimensional door had opened up, and I don't know who took our places for a while. Right. Yeah. No, that's awesome. <laughs> That was pretty cool. Wow. Well, hey, man, I want to thank you so much for hanging out and chatting with me. It's uh, oh. it's a blast to learn learn about uh, your influences and 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 yeah. how that bringing it to the to your broadcast. It helps create a, a a more rounded image of of when you chat about stuff. It makes it hopefully uh, my my friends listening and watching will uh, uh, discover more about the music you play and uh and of course the woggles and uh, we look forward to uh the new record and i know once one i always say once the air raid siren clears it's going to be the roaring 20s you know? absolutely i'm 100 percent on that I, I feel like that i hear plenty of uh people who are like oh there won't be any place to play and it's like people want to make money i mean yeah i mean i, I of course i i'm not happy that businesses that are established or may yeah. not be able to survive. Yeah. But I do know that once we're on the other side, I mean, there will be new, there'll be different places. I mean, yeah. I hope as many places that are still hanging on can continue to hang on. But if that's yeah. not the case, there, there will be other, other places, and, you know. Yeah. New opportunities will, will revol- evolve out of, uh, the heartbeat of rock and roll. Isn't going to stop beating. Isn't going to stop brother. No, not sir. Not at all. Not at all. So <laughs> thank you again for having me today, speaking with me today. 
inviting me on. It's been, a, been a lot of fun. And I'll post everywhere that, that uh, underneath the screen where they people can get in touch with your website and then tune in and so forth. So uh, oh, terrific! Uh, yeah. yeah, and continued success to you and uh, and to you and, and Merry Christmas. Coming yes, up to you. Yeah. Happy uh, New and Year, Merry and, Christmas, and a happy all, all the happy holidays. To yeah. You. Okay, we'll get through this, man. It's going to be good. We'll get out it of that. It will be. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks again, my friend. All right. Bye. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. I'm going to figure out how to leave now. Yeah, here we so go. I, yeah. You ready? Yeah. One, two, two three. three. Go. <laughs> oh, no. Because oh. I have to click twice.